Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's a, uh, wonderful to gather uh, here today to think about connections across theater, performing arts, and we're saying dramaturgy as a mode of curation, where we're thinking about cur curation in very expanded terms. Here today, we have two and actually more uh, amazing artists here to talk about the experiences that they created um, and are still creating on the Zellerbach Playhouse stage, uh, a, an experience of Mary Zimmerman's Metamorphoses. It's a delight to be able to welcome Christopher Harold and Nina Ball uh, to be our interlocutors today. Christopher Harold is a teaching faculty in the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies at UC Berkeley, where he is also an, uh, where he is also an alum. Uh, he is the director as well during the summer of the Summer Training Congress at the American Conservatory Theater. In Berkeley, he uh, and in other places throughout the Bay Area, he uh, has many directing credits, including productions of Our Town, Sauce for the Goose, and The Crucible. He has appeared uh, and he's directed on many stages and also appeared as an actor in many roles, including roles at the Aurora Theater, Magic, Central Works, and Yerba Buena Center. So he is uh, a, a Bay Area treasure and a university treasure, and we're thrilled to have you here tonight. And so thrilled as well to have Nina Ball joining the stage. Nina is uh, an incredible designer who, with a number of credits, and we're so excited that she is working more and more with us at UC Berkeley. She's both a scenic and costume designer whose designs have appeared at uh, American Conservatory Theater, at California Shakespeare Festival, uh, Shakespeare Theater, Marin Theater Company, and many more. Her recent awards include the S. FBCC Awards for her designs for My Fair Lady at SF Playhouse, um, a Broadway World San Francisco Award for Care of Trees at Shotgun Players here on the East Bay, and an Artie Award for her design of Eurydice at Solano College Theater. So we can think about the representation of Eurydice there and uh, here. In addition to theater, she's also worked on numerous film, television, and commercial productions locally and in Los Angeles. And I'm also thrilled that um, many members of the cast are joining us here today and are going to be on hand to answer questions that um, any of us have about the production. Uh, if you haven't seen the production yet, you still have a chance. It will be running uh, Friday, Saturday, and for a Sunday matinee uh, in the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies uh, for the next weekend. For now, let me uh, help me welcome Christopher Harold first to the lectern. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank Shannon Jackson and everyone involved in arranging the Curation Across Disciplines lecture series for the opportunity to share some thoughts today about metamorphoses. I'm honored to be included among the distinguished artists and scholars appearing in this series. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to Nina Ball for being here to speak about her own extraordinary design work on the project, and also to those actors in the cast who are present today. I'm always humbled to be in their presence. I thought I might begin today with a few brief remarks and then ask Nina to share her insights into the process of designing this production and call follow up on uh, that with a question and answer period. My own relationship with metamorphosis has been a long one, and the play has been a sort of companion I've carried in my heart and mind for a long time, along with a lot of sometimes unruly and demanding passengers. Patience, however, is a necessary virtue when you're trying to create something which is inextricably reliant upon a collective. The Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies was actually on the brink of producing metamorphoses a few years ago, but at the last minute, the whole thing collapsed. In short, too much money and too much water. This time, however, the stars aligned in a different way as they sometimes do. In describing my general conception for the show to the designers, I explained that I hoped for something hip with an urban feel something for this time and place, and which was tailored both to the young, vibrant actors with whom I would be working and the audience for whom they would be performing the work. 
somewhat miraculously, I think that we might actually have achieved that, which is a rare enough thing in the world. Metamorphoses, both in Ovid's original incarnation and in Mary Zimmerman's theatrical manifestation, explores concerns which are central to the human heart and mind, whatever our particular epoch or background. Love, hope, greed, joy, home, loss, despair, isolation, betrayal, death, and ultimately, the possibility of redemption. In working with this classical landscape, I imagine the role of the contemporary artist, director, designer, actor, and writer to be a continuation of all that has gone before, allowing for a perpetually evolving interaction with Ovid's stories. The passage of time has not created an inherently problematic relationship with these ancient texts. Instead, we find within them the very essence and expression of our common humanity. In her play, Mary Zimmerman adapts the tales of Ovid's to the vast possibilities and it could be argued the potential confines of the theatrical space, translating and shifting these songs of the air into the performative realms of time and space. When once asked to explain her attraction to the classics, Zimmerman unapologetically replied with a one word summation quality. While provocatively simple, her response effectively goes both to the heart of the work and our own continued desire to engage it. Significantly, Zimmerman also finds within these perpetually relevant, perpetually new tales an embedded theatricality that isn't released until they are staged. That seems to me both insightful and true. On the first page of Metamorphoses, before she introduces any of the characters, Mary Zimmerman writes the following. A note on the staging. The stage is entirely occupied by a square or rectangular pool of water of varying depth, bordered on all four sides by a wooden deck approximately three feet wide. Hanging above the pool is a large crystal chandelier. Upstage, there is a large painting of the sky above which gods and goddesses might appear. Also upstage is a tall double door with steps leading to it from the deck. Ideally, there should be six entrances to the playing area, one on each side of the deck's four corners, one through the doors, and one between the doors and the sky. Additionally, there is a platform from the actors behind the sky with its own entrance and exit. The set has sat well in both thrust and proscenium theaters, but it is essential that the audience look down at the playing space in such a way that the entire surface of the water is visible. All scenes take place in and around the pool with shifts between stories, scenes, and settings indicated by nothing more than a shift in light or a music cue. Although there is a great deal of narration in the play, it should not be taken as a substitution for action or a super superfluous description of that action. The staging should rarely be a literal embodiment of the text. Rather, it should provide images that amplify the text, lend it poetic resonance, or even sometimes contradict it. For the director and designer of Metamorphoses, this passage and others like it throughout the play is complex and potentially elliptical, but still informative. It simultaneously expresses Zimmerman's aesthetic suggestions and hopes, describes the radical metaphoric scenic conception lying at the heart of the work, and finally, defines by implication, if not by direct instruction, the logistical terrain that inevitably derives from those aesthetics and metaphoric overlay. This layered instructional construct is to a certain extent the way in which all plays work in terms of communicating their inner life to the artists who will attempt to present them. The difference really has to do with the magnitude of complexity lying within that communication, which of course makes all the difference. Additionally, 
and significantly, these instructions remind us that a play as written is already an extant, although perhaps not finished, piece of art with its own innate logic, processes, and coherence. This fact must be acknowledged by all of the artists who will seek to curate it as it moves into the realms of time and space. Directors, designers, and actors alike, ultimately they can either embrace or reject what seems inherent, purposefully or sometimes inadvertently, but first they have to acknowledge it. In this way, a play is a very different thing from a painting or a sculpture or a novel, none of which require another set of artists to bring them to a fuller realization. Zimmerman's aesthetics emerge in the most basic sense as a request that the play move fluidly and rapidly in a relatively open space, that it be actional rather than merely narrative. Her concern here, it seems to me, is that the play not become a boring non-event in which we simply watch what we are simultaneously being told is happening. Additionally, there is an evident, if only implied, devotion to doing things simply, not only in terms of the way in which the play proceeds performatively with its vast palette of characters and locations, but also with regard to the theatrical elements which might be used to suggest and embody a kaleidoscopic landscape of locations and events. I'm quite certain that I violated this particular aesthetic hope continually. For example, in Zimmerman's textual description of the moment in which Zeus creates the universe, she simply states that the great god appearing on the upper platform lights a cigarette. Thus, the creation myth is presented and within the realm of the play, the universe is born. I, instead, chose to portray it through a sort of disco rave mashup. Those are aesthetics. <coughs> Metaphor in metamorphoses, of course, derives from the literal presence on stage of water, from which we all came and to which we will all, in some form, return. The characters run through it, sleep in it, eat it, have sex in it, turn to gold and trees in it, fight battles in it, and sometimes die in it. Certainly, it is the addition of this critical element which, which provides the play with its powerful, surprising, and unique resonance, while also injecting the layer of practical complexity I spoke about earlier. If we take a moment to unpack this particular use of metaphor in an attempt to understand its audacity, we will immediately understand that, of course, most of the events portrayed in water will not have literally occurred in it. And yet, having witnessed the play, we cannot imagine it being otherwise. Because metamorphoses has already become in a mere 20 years both iconic and classic, we perhaps carry a certain set of assumptions to our engagement with it and so run the risk of somehow missing the astonishingly brilliant idea of presenting Ovid's tales of transition and transformation in water, assuming retroactively that this was the inevitable and only way to do it. In so doing, we potentially ignore the significant moment of Genesis in which Mary Zimmerman thought, I'm going to write a play for the live theater that takes place in water, thousands and thousands of gallons of it. I'm certain that every single person who was involved with this particular production of Metamorphoses at some point cursed the day she came up with that idea. <laughs> Nevertheless, to truly do Metamorphoses as Zimmerman imagines it, to be its faithful curator, the water has to be there, and therefore it has to be dealt with. Which brings us to the third part of this instructional triptych, logistics which are, at least for me, an essential part of creating any sense of good theater, from the technique of the actor, to the most effective structure for rehearsals, to the timing of lighting and sound cues. While many elements of our set are quite traditional platforms, cycloramas, and curtains, 
and thus not necessarily logistically problematic. The water is another animal entirely, both intoxicating and insidious. It looks and sounds lovely, but it's also cold. Obviously, it's wet, and it essentially goes wherever it wants. Its presence on a live stage begs a host of questions and forces us to confront logistics. How much does it weigh? And which parts of the stage can safely bear that weight? Who will take care of the water once it's present? It needs bromine and heating and sweeping. How long can you ask an, hour, an actor to sit in a puddle of water while you adjust a light cue without having a well-deserved rebellion on your hands? Where do wet actors go when they are off stage? What will the costumes be made of so they can simultaneously interact with the water and still look good? Where do wet clothes go? Which costumes have to be dried during the performance so they can be worn again? How do you prevent people from slipping and injuring themselves? It could go on, but I won't. Suffice it to say that every one of these problems and many more had to be individually and specifically solved by the caretakers or curators of this production. Director, designers, production staff, stage managers, painters, carpenters, costume crews, deck crews, one and all. In the end, and perhaps most fundamentally, curating a play from page to stage means solving as many of its inherent challenges as possible so that it has a chance of becoming within the realms of time and space, something worthy, beautiful, and instructive to our common condition. So I'd like to ask Nina to come up and uh, share her thoughts now on designing the set for Metamorphoses. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm gonna use some other imagery as well to help me with this. I'm gonna cycle through a couple before I land on the right one, so bear with me. Um, so, I'll leave it on a sketch for the moment. Um, I was so lucky to have been asked to design this show. Um, it's been a joy, a pleasure, there's been um, such a such a great staff here at each of the department heads um, and a wonderful group of students that all worked so hard to make this happen this crazy idea that we had that everyone just kept saying yes to we couldn't believe it and they um, made it happen for us and we're just so proud of it so um, typically for me um, I work all over the place so I get to kind of go from port to port I like to say and um, see how things run at different theater companies. And uh, the fact that they chose to do this was just brave and um, pretty phenomenal. Uh, typically, my process would be meeting, uh, meeting the director, starting to talk about concept, uh, sometimes alone in the room, sometimes with the other collaborators. Luckily, in our case, we got to do it with the whole group, which is always better. Um, and Chris, in this case, conceptually, you know, he kind of spoke about what he wanted to do, and what I heard was taking something iconic and turning it a little bit on its head, and really paying homage to uh, Dan Osling's original design, who was the original designer, and um, but doing something fresh and doing something new that people would recognize, but would also feel so um, more of our time in this day today. So taking so that. There was a series of sketches. This is one that's maybe closest to where we kind of ended up with the central pool, rather than it being a rectangle and just a, a square rectangle of water, kind of dissecting that, deconstructing that a little bit and putting this island in the middle and the water around it with the walkway that they could circumnavigate the space. Um, the gods are above still, but uh, just kind of breaking that down a little bit. and. Conceptually, I really grabbed onto the idea of water as a cycle, um, 
the steam rising to cloud, condensing to storm and rain, and returning down to liquid. And that whole, um, that whole cycle was so beautiful of an image for me that I wanted to bring that to the set. So we uh, have the chandelier is replaced by this, um, this cloud. We've kind of reimagined that idea. This is a 3D model I did of an initial, the, when we were first kind of deciding, are we gonna do this or not? This was kind of what I brought to them. And um, so you can see the cloud above from when, when we were researching the piece, we went into art installation, sculpture, um, you know, and then more mundane things like pool and texture and all of that. But the, the big ideas, the, um, this cloud, the, the rain, how it interacts with light and behaves in, um, in how it moves and how it reflects and refracts light was something that I wanted to bring to our world. Um, so yeah, the chandelier is now this giant, beautiful, iridescent cloud that storms and, and holds lightning. And our, our pool as, as this square where it's all collecting the liquid. The, there was a few iterations. Um, this is kind of the one we ended up with, but I'm so glad we ended up with this. Our, our platforming upstage had a different treatment early on and we changed it for a few reasons. And we ended up in this more um, kind of uh, otherworldly, um, outer spacey condensation space that really worked. And I'm so happy that that change had to happen. Often those changes end up being better and better for the piece. Um, yeah, and so once we've gone into concept and we've decided that yes, we're gonna go with this crazy idea, then I um, will do drawings and a model. We get to work in these tiny little dollhouse size models, which is both thrilling and, you know, make your eyes cross and curse them. But this is a little quarter inch scale model where we get to move around the people and uh, see how it looks from different angles and play with it with light. Um, see how the water might behave. There's a couple of those. So it's actually really a wonderful part of my job is getting to make these little models. I do enjoy it. Um, so there's a few things on there that ended up getting cut and that's the nature of our business. Sometimes it's out of necessity, sometimes it's out of time, but it usually always is something that is either better for the piece or maybe didn't need it or um, no one would know but us. <laughs> so there was a few of those elements. And so yeah, some really beautiful production photos came out of that that we're all very proud of. Um, the, a, a little bit about this play, I actually worked on the, uh, I was uh, an assistant designer for Dan Osling when he was doing a, a reimagining of it for a different theater for the arena stage. So I knew exactly how it had been done before. And so it was really great for me to be able to do this. And I think Dan would be proud of <laughs> the changes that we've made, but it's still so um, taking that iconic set and um, really allowing it to shine in a different way. Um, yeah, so I think that um, the revisions and the modifications that had to happen in order to deal with all the water, and Chris spoke so wonderfully about how much of a challenge it can be to work with the water. Um, there's a lot of problem solving. Luckily, we had the production manager and the technical director who had uh, a lot of wisdom about water on stage. They had done both this production when Berkeley Rep did it at the Zellerbach Playhouse and uh, numerous other shows where uh, massive amounts of water had been handled. So they knew what, um, how to contain it. Uh, we had the, the liner was sent off to this shop that built it specifically custom for our, all of our steps and all of our, um, all of the nooks and crannies that we needed to fill. Um, and 
So that was really fortunate. They knew to do the warming booths for the actors. They knew how to track it with the props that dripped more than the next thing. And um, you know, one challenge that we did have is there is these rain curtains that you, having seen the play, never got to experience because we did actually have to cut them because of water containment. We couldn't contain where the water seeped and we thought we had and it just, it is, it is unruly. And, but it is one of those challenges of theater that actually, they still lit beautifully and it was not, you know, you, you sigh for a moment at the loss but it actually was totally fine and worked just as well and just as beautifully and it's par for the course in this business is you really have to be fluid about changing things and problem solving on the fly. And that's part of what makes it so exciting for me as a designer. Um, so once it's all designed kind of in a room with designers separate from the students, then we bring in the students and they were building and learning all of these new uh, paint techniques and how to texture something to be watertight and how to make an iridescent cloud, um, you know, all of these things that they had never done before but did so beautifully. Um, in another theater situation, you would have professionals doing all of this, but the fact that there's these department heads that can teach all of these students these really advanced um, things in order to not only get it out beautifully but get it out in a short amount of time uh, under all of the conditions that theater is so hard to do anyway is really a feat of um, genius that it came together as beautifully and wonderfully as it did. So I'm so proud of it for that. Um, yeah, and then the final, I guess, element to bring in is the audience, right? Once we've worked so hard, we've cued it with the lights and the sound and everything, the crew is moving things and um, everyone's got their pieces and their parts, and then you bring it to an audience for the first time, and they're this missing character that was finally um, with us, and it's the th most thrilling part, actually, is just that first time for an actor, I'm sure, but for everyone who's worked so hard on it, to um, see how it's received, see how it's, um, becomes part of their story as well and the stories that they're bringing into the room resonate with the story we're telling, which is always so fascinating and wonderful to be a part of. It's what makes theater so <laughs> exciting. It's never the same um, from one night to the next. And um, yeah, so it was just a, an absolute joy to work on this piece and um, so happy that I've become part of the the family here and I'm definitely going to push to come back, that's for sure. So yeah, thanks everyone. So glad you guys got to see it already. Chris, would you like me to cycle images or do you want me to leave it on one? Okay. And we'll just put it on our, yeah. Cool, so that'll just go on its own. Go. Does that work? Uh, Jack Carpenter, the lighting designer on this play, was just, wow. I've never worked with him before, but he just really, as a set designer, you, the lighting designer can make your work shine or really um, do the opposite. So you're always having to fight a little to make sure the set looks good, but I didn't have to do any of that with this one. It was um, just, he did such a fantastic job. How would you like it?
one one thing that we started to talk about on Monday was about was um, about say storytelling about and about the distributed storytelling of this of this work, and I wonder it's a bit more of a question for Chris, but Nina, you certainly chime in if you could talk a little bit more ab about the orchestration of voices share that are working together in the telling of a story that perhaps is a little different from a traditional realistic play, for instance, um, and, and how you think about that. Thank you. Uh, yes, I certainly wouldn't call metamorphoses a realistic play in terms of its presentation of either human interaction or, or the way in which that might occur. And uh, Zimmerman utilizes a lot of different tools to make the play sort of float, no terrible pun intended. Um, she's got a narrative sub-thread that is very sustaining to the play in which people come out and she just calls them narrator one, narrator two, narrator three, and they do the age-old thing which we have all loved for the entirety of our existence, which is to be told a story um, and to sit and listen to it. So that's what the narrators do. And then the characters enact it, either in fulfillment of what's being said or as a kind of counterpoint to what's being said. And for me, theater is always a visual art form. Um, something that you want to look at and get meaning from. My dream as a director would be that you could turn off the sound on any given production and always understand what's going on at any given moment, even if you didn't hear what was being said in the dialogue. Uh, and I hope we achieve that with this uh, performance. Um, the characters that occupy the landscape are mythical, they are gods, they are extraordinary human beings, but they're also uh, very what I think we could call common people uh, living in a quiet sort of way and she brings all of that to bear uh, during the course of the play. I guess, oh, why don't you go first, okay? Okay, thanks, and I have um, several questions for Nina Bow. I love your design, and um, first question that, can you view your experience as an experience of curating a space, or rather than as design a stage? And secondly, it's about the question that I seen on the introduction that you say that you're a scenic designer, or you view yourself like an artist. And, sa and second, and third question is about that, because you're building the stage with the direction of the written sentences, so do you have any like innovative or some cre per independent design on stage or, and how this kind of like, was what's your inspiration and what's your thought about it? Thanks. Thank you, that's a lot of questions. I'm gonna, okay, so the first one, yes, um, design as curation. I mean, we're doing, sometimes we're doing new work where we get to pave the road and, and um, kind of do it ourselves for the very first time. And often we're doing a play over and over and over. And so every time I'm designing something different than the last person doing it, I'm curating it in a different way, I see. and. So um, the director comes with a concept, the designer interprets that concept and, and makes their own concept. And everyone kind of brings um, a bit to the soup, if you will. And that collaboration, that curation of that piece for that specific um, moment, that specific um, interpretation of that work uh, I, th I think it's con we're constantly doing that. We're constantly uh, 
curating each work uh, every time it's done and redone or thought of for the first time. Um, as far as the second question was, uh, the tell me your second question again. Sorry. I think they're um, designers are absolutely artists. Yes, um, it's part of what drew me to set design from my background as a scientist going into fine art, going into scenic design was the um, how it married the analytical and the, the wildly creative in a way that finally caught my attention for any amount of time. Uh, my background is, um, besides the sciences, I, I was a marine scientist for my <laughs> early <laughs> undergrad world and then went off to fine art school and wanted to be a studio artist, but it's so lonely in that <laughs> room. And so I wanted to collaborate with others. I wanted to tell stories in a way that was more of um, a, a group kind of, I think it's a, everything is stronger with more voices in the room. And so not only do you have to fight for your ideas, but you have to be, very humble and open to other people's ideas. And um, so the it's absolutely a beautiful art form of not only the visual, but, um, but the words dealing with people, how we, how we get someone to, to take our idea and run with it. And it's, it's a, such a wonder, it is a beautiful, um, uh, world to live in day to day, I think. And finally, your last question real quick was? Um, my last question is that you make your this design based on some already written sentences of the descri description of his ideal stage. Do you have any like independent and creative uh, scenic designs experience and what's your inspiration? Well, uh, you read what the stage directions were and we definitely took those stage directions and um, and made our own interpretation, which you often can do as a, um, when you're entering into a show. Um, there is a few, a few um, that you cannot, <laughs> that, the, that the, they're held very tightly and you have to follow the rules about how that production is is staged, but for the most part, we get some latitude in how we approach a set. There's things that need to happen, especially if you're doing a li living room drama or something like that, you need the sink, you need this. There are elements that you need, but you have a lot of flexibility and leeway to reinterpret. Hey, first of all, I wanna say, Berkeley students ask the most awesome questions. <laughs> so, um, I'm one of the co-professors of, of the class, and um, I, I'm a little bit of a broken record in this class. I'm always curious uh, about how people envision the audience as they're creating the work. So you made a kind of a touching reference to you know when when it first opens, the audience becomes the next the other performer. Um, but I'm curious in the in the, you know how how do you first of all what are the kind of presuppositions uh, in the dramaturgy and the play and the directing that you make of the audience's knowledge. Um, uh, do you change the, your approach based on the, how you anticipate the audience will be? Um, and how does that sort of feed into the creative process in both of your cases? Um, well, I think the first thing I think about a Berkeley audience is that they're going to be very smart. And uh, they're going to be activist they're not going to receive art passively and just sort of uh, accept whatever you might put out there. They're going to think about not only the methodology by which you arrived at the art, but they're also going to think about what you are implying <laughs> and what you are generating in terms of uh, the meaning of it. So, um, Yes, I also think here, particularly at UC, it's a young audience. You know, probably 70 or 80 percent of it is, uh, I would guess, people in their 20s. Um, 
and while I hope to direct for a particular audience, I never just want to become gray, and then the art becomes a sort of mishmash of your assumptions about what people will or will not like. Uh, my partner actually, after the Sunday performance, uh, you know, had a funny story to tell me. He said, as soon as the uh, little disco dance mashup was done, somebody in the front row got up and walked out very indignantly, <laughs> you know, and uh, that made us both giggle a lot because I, uh, I personally think he should have waited around, right? There's a little bit of classicism coming for him later if he just be a little patient. But I can also imagine somebody sitting there and thinking, what in the name of God is this going to be? And I don't want to watch boys dancing in miniskirts or whatever, you know, whatever he may have perceived it to be. So that's okay with me, right? Uh, I think him leaving is a good thing, right? I mean, in terms of, wow, I actually generated a response in somebody instead of this gray inertia that we're all sinking into more deeply every day. So that's good for me. Yeah, for me too, I, um, I also assume that my audience is gonna be s smart and that the, the visual representation of how we work so hard to, to make choices that push forward themes and uh, big concepts, that they will catch those. And even if they don't catch them, um, they will uh, seep into them <laughs> and so they will understand, they will understand things deeper by the visual representation of things on stage is always what I'm shooting for. Um, not to overpower, but yet to kind of, uh, yeah, seep in. Um, I also am happy, or I don't know if happy is when people get up and walk out, but you do want, you do want people to be um, moved. You want, um, you want that energy after that people need to s talk about it together. That it's not just we experience this thing and then, what do you think? Oh, was good, okay, what are we gonna go eat for dinner? You know, you want the, the story to be um, something that lives on and is, is discussed um, for hours and hours and days later and things dawn on you after a week that you didn't know or realize that it um, made such an impression, whether you hated it at that moment or not. Often some of the ones that I was most frustrated with in the chair are ones that stuck with me the most after for whatever reason, and it tells you a lot about yourself, and that's uh, what we're trying, we're, we're studying the human condition here, doing theater, and so how to, whatever way you can, um, learn more about ourselves and each other. Thank you for your quest question, um, for your answer. I have two questions. One has to do with something you said about the quality of the piece and the embedded theatricality that was not necessarily released until the work has been staged. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about what you mean by theatricality. So what is it about the particular story that lends itself to the medium of theater versus, say, a story that has a cinematic quality? And then my second question is, is really very simple, which is, in one of our readings for this week, there was an interview with an artist who was fairly critical about the use of um, video projection or digital projection in theater. So I'm wondering if you could talk more generally about that trend or that choice. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the information about the embedded theatricality, that was actually a direct quote from Mary Zimmerman that she found that quality in those texts. And um, I agree with her. You know, what I think uh, a play does is take something off the page and put it in time and space for you in a way that is to a large extent curated or even imagined for you, right? So what you're seeing in this production of Metamorphoses, you know, uh, Zimmerman's text may say something like, um, Poseidon 
and the henchmen come down and I think it says something very close to they fight with the sailors in the water, right? That's it. And then another page later it says Poseidon and the henchmen leave. So I'm left with that little sentence and I think, well, what does that mean they fight in the water, right? And what is the embedded theatricality of that little description? And for me, I don't want to just tell the actors, okay, get in the water and tussle a little bit with each other because I think it looks aesthetically ugly and I also think it doesn't have any meaning, right? You don't, you don't look at that and get any impression of it. So uh, I choreographed what uh, one of my friends called a murder ballet. I said, oh, I really like that murder ballet. <laughs> and I knew exactly what she was talking about at that moment. And I think Ovid's Metamorphoses and Zimmerman's play are full of things like that, right? When you're reading the text, you are your own theater. If you're reading Jane Eyre or something, you are creating that or I guess I can only speak for myself, you're creating that landscape in your mind and people look a certain way and the room they're in has certain colors in your mind. Uh, the heroine looks a certain way, but you're generating all of it. And what we do is pick up the embedding and put it in time and space. Sure. Well, I think, I think I'm giving you the vision that you would in a novel generate for yourself, right? So when you read, if you were reading Metamorphoses on the page and it says the men fight in the water, uh, I don't know what you do with that imaginally or if you just skip over it rapidly, if that's merely informational for you or if in your mind what plays out is this two and a half minute long slow series of two strangulations, a throat cutting, and one sailor gets beaten to death, right? Those are all very specific ends of four lives to me, and in that way they're theatricalized. I'll talk about that. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it's now become much more common. Mo most theaters own projection equipment and these screens, and so I think what people and what the conversation I have of the for and against that I've had with a lot of people is uh, how it's done. Is it being done to as a shortcut? Is it being done to replace um, the the money, the work, the effort of, of thinking about it and um, building scenery and, and breaking it down in a more traditional way. Um, often it's used just as like a, a literal backdrop and it doesn't propel the story forward. So it, it's, for me, it's how it's used. I've seen it used in beautiful, beautiful ways. Uh, what is the ACT show that just happened? Um, needles and opium, opium and yeah, needles and opium. If anyone saw that, like wow, the media, the projection for that pushed the story so beautifully. It was done so well in that way. I think um, absolutely we should embrace uh, projection. But if um, it's done a little bit of an afterthought and not really thought through in a way that. Um, pushes the story and helps the story, then then people, then I under, absolutely understand the problems that people have with it. And you know, it's a bit of um, old school, new school fight a little bit too. And people want to come to the theater and not watch a movie. So when they see that, they're a little bit turned off of, oh, here we go. This is not why I came. And so it's, um, yeah, it's not for everyone, and but it's absolutely about, you know, being thoughtful about how it's how it's used for me. Um, so, when casting characters for a for a play like your play, um, I was wondering how you make sure the cast wrote or reflects the original characters. Um, got, ha 
have to go back a couple of steps. So the first big dose of reality in any director's life is who shows up at the auditions, right? Because automatically that sends you down a certain path that you can't get off of, right? Which puts us back in even, even one step more. You better be careful picking a play that you somehow know you can cast. Um, so my own take of it is that I'm looking for, in this instance, 15 astonishingly talented people who can do a variety of things. I'm looking for uh, a diverse cast, and I mean that in every sense of the word, and then I actually want them to teach me what the characters are about and to convince me that they are, in fact, the character. And I think that's what an actor's doing at an audition, right? Their whole job in that moment is to say, you want me for this job, and I'm about to show you why through the acting. And I think that's what they do all the way through the process. Um, I also try never to enter into a production with any notion at all about any character that he is this way, and he looks like this, and he sounds like this, and her body is like this, right? Because uh, there are many terrible manifestations lurking in an idea like that. Having said that, there are also practicalities. So uh, Teddy, um, <laughs> wonderful Teddy, Teddy happens to be able to sing Mozart, <laughs> right? And one night at a rehearsal, I said, uh, can you sing uh, Cozzi von Tutti? And Teddy said, eh. <laughs> I thought, okay, he's a classic actor, right? No matter what you ask an actor, if they can do, they always say, mm-hmm. And then the next night, he shows up with a completely worked passage from Mozart's opera. So of course, Teddy is Apollo because I don't have 15 people in the room who could say, sure, I can sing that opera. He can actually do it. Uh, Joe is a dancer, so I know he can carry those bodies and deposit them in the water, right? All of the actors just, and I would never talk to them about this, strike me as having certain qualities, right? Who seems softly empathetic, who seems a little bit remotely distant, uh, who seems tough, who seems vulnerable, and then uh, putting all of that together. And I'd never talk to them about that. Uh, well, I, I, I want to talk to them about it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, before we go to the next question, c maybe could we have any of the actors give any of their responses to that inquiry, or whether it was moments where you were kind of um, either intimidated or confused by being cast in a certain way, or moments when you found, like, you kind of got something or found it or, or want to respond to what Chris said? <laughs> um, hello. <laughs> I am Claire. If you've seen the show, I play a uh, series who is a goddess and I also um, play the therapist to Phaethon in the Apollo scene which Teddy sings in. Um, I think for me it was uh, as far as casting goes, I felt <laughs> very in tune <laughs> with the parts I was given. Um, I think I'm a strong, tough person, and I think the goddess of Ceres really does portray that in her um, mythic vignette. Um, You're I'm also not gonna very bossy, Claire. Yeah, I'm also very bossy. Um, I know. <laughs> I didn't want to let them know, though. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, so I think that aspect of my personality was just projected in the theatrical way that Zimmerman refers to, um, as Chris referred to. Um, and the therapist too, I think I've learned as I've been in the department as an actor and I've heard feedback from other people that I come across very intelligent. <laughs> I just use big words and all those kinds of things and I think the therapist character is that's exactly what she does in the entire scene is just give you this Freudian analysis of this person. Um, and it was a great challenge and exploration for me to be smart, but also be understood. 
um, which I think is something that is difficult to do, especially somewhere like Berkeley, where we like to get so smart <laughs> that we sometimes lose our ability to have everyone else understand what we're saying. Um, and that was something I worked on um, tirelessly in that scene, just um, so the audience could glean what I was trying to say. Well, I think it's really important to have that in mind in terms of casting, of uh, promoting diversity. Um, I think that's something that's lacking in theater now. Um, and I'm so happy to see it in this uh, reflecting in this production. Um, and how immediately w we bonded as a cast was lovely. I thought it was something um, that I will now hold as a standard uh, to er any other and every other production that I I am a part of. Uh, I think it's wonderful to have it, you know, come from a uh, from the ground up. Uh, I think it's a, a stepping stone in terms of the theater that I envision in the future. I hope that in the future there are many, um, you know, much more diversity in uh, in positions of leadership or even in. Uh, in casting or in directing and writing. Um, I was uh, saying to a few of my castmates that this might be one of the very few plays that I've ever been in written by a female author, and I think that's something that needs to change. I, I want to be a part of, of um, plays written by female authors, but plays written by, I mean, uh, directed by female authors, designed by female designers, or even um, by um, people who aren't necessarily showcased in um, uh, mainstream media. I think that's something that's very important. Um, hello. Thank you. Uh, I have one question for each of you. Um, for Chris, were there, um, like you were talking about with the introduction, were there any other uh, unique takes or departures from Zimmerman or unique views on the embedded theatricality that you felt notable or um, happy with in terms of presenting? And for Nina, in terms of like how central the stage was for the entire production, or at least uh, this production of Metamorphoses, um, how far ahead could you allow yourself in designing the set before you would, or before like, um, you could get too like caught up with small details that would like hurt the creative process. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, th the set design is so far. You have to design so far out from a production's actual um, opening. There's so much that goes into it, so you have to think about all of that stuff simultaneously. Actually. You're thinking about big gestures, but you're also thinking about like the location of the light switch or whatever, not in this one, but how people, it's really important to me, flow of, act of actors and how they move around. And um, if, if, if their movement is at all impaired by the big concept, then we've failed. So um, yeah, it's, it's all kind of happening at the same time. And that's why these, great collaborative meetings are so important where we're working and thinking about that stuff with the costume designer who's also giving us some um, red flag warnings or the technical director who's saying, well, you need to think about this. And so we're, it really is this um, group effort. <laughs> you're, you're trying to do as much of it and keep it all in your mind, but it really is about um, all of us kind of bringing all of our wisdom to the table and, and thinking about all those little details as well as the big pictures at the same time. Uh, your question is a very interesting one, thank you. You know, the, the amount of, uh, and I don't, this is gonna sound pejorative and I don't mean it to, but for example, the amount of control that Mary Zimmerman has over one of her plays is astonishing, right? So when we talk about curating it, or uh, uh, and I support that, right? So when we talk about curating a play, or changing it, or differing from what is on the page, 
it's not only an aesthetic and one might even say moral conundrum, it's also a legal one. Um, for example, uh, on, any, on the poster of Metamorphoses, Mary Zimmerman's name must appear in a certain fa font size. My name must appear vis-a-vis -vis her name in a smaller font size. <laughs> you know, and I, yeah, I, I get that. And you'll never, you don't ever see in a program or on a poster, most plays don't say originally directed by so-and-so, right? But uh, in her instance, that is what happens. So we have to be very, very careful. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, Will Leggett, our production manager, I got a note from him one day. I get 500 notes every day from people. And this one said, I heard you're adding a, a movement piece at the beginning of the show. Uh, you need to come and talk to me about this immediately. You can't do that. So I thought, okay, uh, this is number one, wrong information. And I wrote Will and I said, Will, it's actually not before the show starts. This is where I am placing the creation myth, so it's blocking, right? It's not an add-on to the show, it's the way I'm manifesting the creation of the world. She does it with him lighting a cigar, I want that five minute long piece. Will immediately said, oh, that's okay, <laughs> right? Because I wasn't moving things around, I was interpreting them. Um, even though I think I could hear Mary Zimmerman across the continent maybe screaming a little. Uh, the second major change I made was in the Eros and Psyche story. And uh, we had to get Mary's permission to do that. I wanted it to be two men. And I had originally thought about making the final scene either two women or two men, Baucus and Philemon. And I could never get that to feel right in my mind. So then I moved it to Eros and Psyche. And before I was able to make that decision, I sort of rudely ran a number of actors through that scene and wouldn't tell them who was going to actually end up playing that role. And I wasn't being mean, although I may have been being mean inadvertently. I just couldn't decide what I wanted to do. And then I finally decided, no, it needs to be two men because I want that represented on stage. I want the two men, or it could have been two women, I want them to have the successful relationship that is blessed by the gods and gets to last forever <laughs> instead of somebody voting on it, right? In central California, uh, God says it's okay and that it's actually gonna last forever. Um, and she immediately gave us permission to do that for which I was very grateful. I have a, a really quick question. Um, thank you so much for uh, giving this talk. Uh, I teach theater to high school students. You have many of them in the room right now. Um, and we may need to s sneak out to keep our field trip going. So please don't be offended if a whole bunch of teenagers get up. Um, we're from Kip King Collegiate down in San Leandro and uh, we've never been here. We're very excited. Um, we're very excited because most of these kids, no, all of these kids, they're seniors and their English teacher has given them an assignment. They read a play and they have to reimagine it and do uh, set design and costume design and all of these things. So this is the first time most of them have experienced A, reading a play and having then also having to uh, think about reimagining it and redesigning it. So just briefly, do you have a bit of advice for them? Because they just were given this assignment and then I told them we were coming here and that you were speaking. They got really excited. They're feverishly taking notes back here. So if you have any advice, what would it be? Thank you. Uh, I remember clearly the first play I ever read was Death of a Salesman. And that's when the world changed for me. And the reason it changed was because I found uh, Miller's descriptive passages so evocative and they set my mind on fire, and I was imagining everything he was describing in a way quite different from a novel or even from actually watching something that's already been put in time and space. So for me, approaching a play, um, it's something that I want to imagine moment by moment visually in my mind. And I 
yeah, that's how I think about directing too. So I would urge them to come to the work that way, uh, that they're going to get to create it as they read it with some help from the playwright. I would say, well, you've already read it. Read it again. You know, what were your first impressions when you first read it? Jot those down. Read it again. Be a little bit more technical with the way you read it. And then research, research, research. And what, what jumps forward to you? Just what compels you? Um, I always find that research image that maybe I skipped over, but I keep coming back to. So make yourself go to the library, not just on the internet. Look at pictures as much as you can and be inspired. What is inspiring to you? And let that little voice, that nagging voice that you keep coming back to in that in your mind, listen to it because it's um, got some wisdom there. Hello. Okay. Um, so we've been studying escape attempts in theater and how um, we envision things and how it diverges in each new production. And we heard a little bit about how it's been done in the play, but I want to ask some of the cast members if anything was asked of them that they considered to be like non-traditional in theater. <laughs> what exactly do you mean by non-traditional? So, um, yeah, <laughs> there's the whole opera, opera aspect, but I think the most important thing about this play is that these are ancient, ancient stories. So the whole point is to make it really modern in this era, because otherwise, I mean, she wasn't going to just redo it for nothing. So by adding the play to it, uh, by adding the water, excuse me, we have this use of a really real element to convey, to convey the surreal in a way that makes it imaginative and provocative to an audience so that we can see these mythic stories portrayed in an unrealistic way so an audience can believe that. Like the story with Cyrus and Mira, we can't show um, you know, a father having sex with his daughter with a blindfold on. So we put it in water and we lift her up and we spin her around and we make it look pretty. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> Mine is not as eloquently stated as that, but I play Pomona and she's a wood nymph. And so the stage direction, the stage direction that I have says she skips around. And so Chris and I were having conversations in the beginning of the process as to what do you mean she skips around? Like, how does she skip around? How long does she skip around for? Where does she skip? When does she stop skipping? Um, and so we toyed with that for a little bit, and there were many rehearsal evenings where I was skipping for about an hour straight, got my work out in. But I think that was kind of an interesting thing that just, even though I don't have any lines at that point, by just skipping, it conveys an entire story. And by moving around and stopping in certain places and giving these kind of dirty looks to my scene partner's character, not my scene partner, my scene partner's character, um, really, is a kind of an interesting way of showing it while there's a narration going on. So another point in the play, I'm also a narrator. So I kind of get it from both ends, telling the story with words and then telling the stories physically. And it's just telling the story physically while skipping is just kind of an interesting take that I don't think I've ever been asked to do. So it was, it was an interesting challenge especially once we added water and trying not to fall into the pool or fall into the audience's lap. So, um, yeah, that would, that would be my answer to you. You know, there are a couple of other things I'm, I might add to that uh, that I considered asking the actors to do things that I, uh, you know, felt could be potentially be problematic. One large issue is the costumes, you know. Um, I think they're revealing I think they have to do difficult things in those costumes, and Wendy and I never wanted anybody to feel objectified, which I count as a different thing than merely presenting a body in a certain costume, right, which makes it look, look a certain way. So Wendy, I, as I understand it, checked with all of the actors thoroughly through all of the 100 costumes that appear in the play, 
making sure that the actors felt that was something they could wear without feeling uh, damaged interiorly or um, feeling precarious exteriorly. There was another precarious moment for me, uh, and it goes back to the uh, Psyche and Eros scene. Uh, and as I was trying to decide how I wanted to do that, I certainly felt compelled when I knew I was going to ask G to potentially play Psyche. Zach was always playing Eros. And I actually have a little bit of a moral conundrum in myself about this, right, in my own feelings about the situation. I did feel that I had to write a note to G and ask him if he was comfortable kissing another man in public, right? Because while we may think, well, he is an actor and he will do what I ask him to, that that is the dynamic, there are lines that can be crossed that have other, th that have to do with other things than the fact that he or she is acting a moment, right? Things that they simply, that are not tenable in their universe. And G, I hope you won't uh, be angry at me for this. G wrote me back a very long and sweet discourse <laughs> saying he would be happy to talk about that interpretive moment for, with me and to see what my idea was behind that and what I was thinking. And, you know, he went on. <laughs> and I had to write him back and say, no, G, you have a misimpression here. I'm asking you if you will kiss a man. As an actor, I don't care what you think about the scene interpretationally, <laughs> right? Because it's going to be interpreted the way that I say it's going to be interpreted. Will you kiss Zach? And he wrote back, ah, sure. <laughs> you know. And uh, I also had to ask Zach if he felt comfortable kissing another man because that wasn't part of the original bargain when I cast him in that role, right? was also potentially true that the character Zach was playing, Eros was going to appear nude. That's how Zimmerman describes him. And before, at auditions, before casting, we had to ask every actor, will you appear nude? Because that's not something that can come at you down the pipeline and you realize two weeks before opening, you want me to what? Uh, so all of those things are delicate because you're dealing with individual humans and the way that they need to be perceived in the world. And for me, those are the difficult stretches that actors are required to do. I, I have a question about the budget. Uh, how much, <laughs> how much is it limiting uh, for your imagination and actually how much it can be a creative uh, force? Yeah, budget is always a, a blessing and a curse, and um, the constriction absolutely does uh, necessitate um, ingenuity and rethinking. Uh, we were lucky that there was quite a large budget. I'm not going to mention numbers, but it was a decent budget because they knew they were undertaking a very big thing. It was planned and set aside in order to water is is very expensive to deal with and um, but even within that even with all of the yeses that were given to us early with the um, with the design th even after it's approved there has to be no's sometimes as things start um, taking longer or or problems arise that you didn't think about and um, so there was absolutely a lot of back and forth with with the with the design, with the budget, but I always see that as um, I'm never um, bummed out about that. It's just part of the the living, breathing thing that this piece is, that every piece is, the dialogue of of reality and and making it happen, and desire, and what's best for the play. It often is always better in the end. Uh, I find. Um, but yeah, there was there was a lot of challenges and the things that were cut, we, we were a little bit sad about, but again, I think there was so many beautiful things to look at that we didn't miss them. 
You know, I, I, I would add to that. I never ask about the budget because I don't want to know. Uh, I just keep asking for things and they say yes or no. Um, it, the only thing Will would say to me is, well, you're now, you're quadruple over budget. And I'd say, oh. <laughs> um, the, the other thing, uh, the other thing about a university, and it's why university theater is so important, you could never stage this at most theaters in this country because the man hours of those expert painters, carpenter, carpenters, designers, seamstresses, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to pay for that. You could not pay 15 equity actors for a, a five week rehearsal session, it's just not tenable. So when you talk about a budget in this configuration, it's actually an interesting uh, dynamic about where the money comes from and how much it really is because something like that is astronomically expensive. Yes, yes. Uh, hi, uh, I would actually like to know the answers to your question you've drawn, like where do what actors or what clothes go? And how are the actors back in stage so quickly without looking wet? Like, did they dry themselves backstage? How did they get fresh clothes? Yeah, I would like to. I love your question. And to me, that's the glory of theater. You would not believe the apparatus that is underway backstage during that hour and a half show. There are two huge booths built on either side of the stage that are enclosed, they're equipped with heaters for the actors. There are 60 or 70 towels backstage for them to dry off. Uh, clothes are being taken down to the dryer during the course of the performance and brought back up to the actors so they don't have to get into them wet. Uh, uh, there's an enormous costume crew of eight people who are doing rapid changes, probably yanking clothes on and off of the actors uh, more than they would like. Um, we borrowed 70 towels a day from the RSF, uh, which they were so generous about. They had to be taken back, soaking wet every night. Then there was another whole set of towels that were used to mop the floor. They couldn't obviously be interchanged with the towels that were going to be touching the actors' bodies. Um, so it's a massive undertaking. And the amount of pre-planning that the production staff did in terms of tackling all of that astounded me. Uh, and then I think after we leave the theater every night, there's a whole crew who has to stay and do laundry. Oh. It's not in the, the cycle of images, but one of the production photos was all of the cast and crew and everyone who had worked on the play circling the pool. And it's, if you, when you see the amount, there's almost as many people in this room. You know, it, there's so many people that go into making something um, that are behind the scenes that are heroes that you don't get to you don't get to think but they it's it's pretty in incredible another interesting little statistic some of the actors have up to four pairs of underwear per show <laughs> that's a that's a costume a costume element yeah, costumes. Well, I, um, people talk about collaboration in the arts, and it really is one of those moments I think we realize today, and especially with this production, um, about how much uh, productions like this push the envelope about what collaboration actually is and requires, and what it might be to give um, these sort of infrastructural questions, these logistical questions, an aesthetic integrity. Um, and both of you represent so generously and so inventively, I would say, the aesthetics of logistics uh, next to the aesthetics of narrative. And we want to thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your wisdom with us. Uh, students, there's one last logistical uh, element uh, regarding our class. Uh, t I think two more notes from Pei Ting. Very quickly, a reminder that we're seeing State of Siege on Saturday, so I'll be waiting with your tickets, 7.30 under the bear. 
And then the optional screening for the Chantal Ackerman film, News From Home, is tomorrow at 7 p.m. Your names are all given to the front desk, so this is completely optional. But if you choose to go, Professor Bo is recommended getting there half an hour early. Okay, so tomorrow, optional, Saturday, required.